All right, I'm going to walk you briefly through the cdms.net website. There's a lot of things here. All you really need, um, instead of their advanced search or any of their testimonials, you can purchase products from them. But all you really need to click on is their product databases. And you can see you can get a couple of things within that. But if you just click on the product database itself, you will find that you can do a search for any company, any product that you're looking for as far as a label is concerned. So it's a great way to find different labels um, if you need those for your company or anything like that. So if we happen to pick on one of them, who shall we pick on today? Why don't we pick on Real Farm Technologies LLC? I don't know, and I use that term lightly, of course. And these are the products that they have the labels for. So if we look at, for example, the chemical barrier, what you want to find is the specimen label. And this is the official legal label. And that's the thing with a pesticide label. It is a legal document. You are legally required to abide by everything that is in this document. And I'm going to scroll really fast here before I start showing you a little bit more. Legally, everything in this document. So let me go back up to the beginning and I'll show you how to find things. You can see right away here we have the chemical name. Uh, this is the common name barrier. The active ingredient is listed down here as tebuconazole. And then the chemical name is the alpha 24 chlorophenol ethyl alpha 11 dimethyl ethyl 1H124 triazole 1 ethyl. That's the chemical name. The other one, the tebuconazole, that's the basically the common name for the active ingredient. And then barrier is going to be the name for the product. You can see it does have a caution, basically keep it out, keep out of reach of children, some first aid things. So you do get cautions, warnings, uh, there's danger. There's a lot of different words that they utilize there. And each one is increasing in terms of the danger and the toxicity basically of, of the chemical. It'll tell you about any personal protective equipment that you need to wear. Um, any environmental hazards, like this one that says this pesticide is toxic to mammals, fish, and aquatic invertebrates, do not apply directly to water. So you can find safety um, requirements about there. You can see here, directions for use. They'll tell you right here, this product, use this product only in accordance with its labeling. Do not allow worker entry into treated areas during the restricted entry level, the REI. Right? And it tells you exactly what that is. So it's important if you're applying chemicals that you read these things. It tells you exactly how to mix the product. Maybe applied in a minimum of 10 gallons of spray solution per acre by ground sprayer. So, and then it, even this one here has an aircraft sprayer. So it tells you how to mix the product. It tells you what mixing order, if that's important. Now, not every chemical will have all of this because every chemical is a little bit different. And it starts to tell you about what crops you can use this on. So you can use this on asparagus to control rust, and it tells you how many, um, how much to use. You could use it on barley to control rust and head blight. So when you're filling out your form, what you're going to be looking at is this one has a lot of uh, a lot of crops that you can use this on, a lot of diseases that it's targeting. So you could, for example, say that this chemical is good on crops such as asparagus barley, beans, and other row crops. It's targeting different species of rust or leaf blight. So those are the sorts of things that you want to be looking for when you're doing your assignment. Okay, so that's some basics on how to read a label. Everything should be roughly in the same order. Some labels will have more or less in an area based on the type of label that you're dealing with and the crops that, it's, that it controls and how safe the chemical is to use. So this is gonna be a short video on explaining what an LD50 is here. So the LD50 is the lethal dose, LD50, that kills 50% of a population of animals, usually over a given a certain period of time. You can see here from the definition, the toxic agent could be anything, like a chemical, uh, a food, a drug, it could be a poison, a virus, a radiation, and it could be an animal. Sometimes they, they often use rats, sometimes they use mice, sometimes they use rabbits, occasionally they use dogs. Um, 
and the drug can be the chemical can be administered either orally injected into the bloodstream or contact on the skin and some of that just really depends upon um, how that chemical is going to be utilized in in day-to-day -day life so everything has an LD50 so the good thing about LD50 is we can use the number to determine relative toxicity of something right so a, a something with a very high LD50 is not very toxic where something with a very low LD50 is far more toxic. Everything has these. So if we look at lethal doses of common chemicals, so, and this happens to be in, in, in humans, but they do the testing in, in animals. All right, so for water, for most humans, roughly 75 kilograms, 180, 185 pounds for, for men, right? Six liters, you drink six liters of water, and for a 50% of the people who drink six liters of water in one sitting will die. 118 coffees will give you enough caffeine to kill 50% of the population. Now, I want you to notice that if we look at the caffeine, it's, that's 240 milliliters. All right, well, if you add 118 coffees at 240 milliliters, that's actually more water than you can drink in the coffee. So you're actually more likely to die of water overdose than you are caffeine overdose. Alcohol, uh, 13, roughly 13 shots, basically, you know, just a, like a regular tequila shot, 13 of them. All right. So that we know that things vary in there. Here's the challenge. How many people do you know that they have two drinks and they're gone? Others can have five or six drinks and then they're gone. So a lot of these things depend on how big you are, what you've had to eat beforehand, your uh, buildup of a chemical, particularly when it comes to things like caffeine or alcohol. But here's the, th the challenges that we have with these nowadays. It gives us a rough idea of what would, um, what might, what might kill you, but it doesn't tell us anything else about that. We don't know how sensitive you personally are to an individual chemical. And also, it's very difficult to extrapolate out from animals into human beings. So, let me scroll down a little bit. Let me find the one here on dogs. So, there's, here's a paragraph here on dogs, right? Animals aren't humans. We, for example, can eat chocolate. We can actually eat so much chocolate that you'd probably be more likely to die of a full stomach than anything else. You know, 100 milligrams of of theobromine, which is the chemical in chocolate that's dangerous to dogs, per kilogram of your body weight. So if you weigh around 180 or 185 pounds, that's 75 kilograms. So 100 milligrams per kilogram is something that most humans can tolerate. Dogs, on the other hand, can only tolerate about 300 milligrams per kilogram. So a 50-pound dog is only going to be about 20 kilograms, 18 to 20 kilograms. That's not nearly as much chocolate as they can handle, which is why dogs are likely to die of chocolate. The other thing that happens is, is how do we test this stuff? Well, we'll test this stuff on animals. So you take a population of 100 mice and you inject chemical into them or you make them drink this chemical until 50 of them die. That's really not very ethical. So we are trying to find ways to either A, use fewer animals in testing and they do actually have some procedures down here. Here's the first one is five male and five female rats. That's still utilizing animals, but it's not thousands and thousands of animals. Um, the up-down procedure, the animals are tested once, observed for a couple of days. If they survive, an increased dose is given them. They're observed for a few more days. If they die, a decreased dose is given. Again, we're utilizing animals, but it's not nearly as, as many. What we're hoping to be able to use eventually is the cell-based screening methods. We're looking at cells in a lab at that point. And that way you can pull human cells out, you can pull animal cells out. It avoids the, the ethical issues of utilizing animals in testing. But it's very difficult sometimes things that happen in an individual cell in a petri dish do not happen when that cell is attached to the body simply because of all of the other hormones and enzymes and chemical processes that all of our bodies have. What it does provide, however, 
is the ability for us to compare the lethality of products. So again, a product that has a very low number is going to be extraordinarily lethal. A product with a very high number is not going to be lethal at all. All right, as always, if you've got any questions, don't hesitate to get in touch.